to my surprise, and that is why I thought I'd share it with you, there exists a vast archive containing notebooks, articles, personal letters and other documents written by Sir Isaac Newton. And this particular archive has been deliberately neglected for the last 300 years because it contains astonishing and for some people unacceptable information about this extraordinary man. I'm talking about an archive belonging to Isaac Newton that contains his 30 years of research in the field of alchemy. We can learn from it that Newton was actively and passionately searching for the mysterious Philosopher's Stone. According to him, it was an object so powerful that its quest to find it needed to be undertaken in the most secretive way. Just so you know, this is not a made-up story. This archive exists and it is a crucial piece in the puzzle if we want to really understand who Isaac Newton was and if we want to get a glimpse of his personality and his beliefs. Welcome back to Bold Books and Bones. We could ask ourselves, how could a man who is the icon of rationality be intrigued or even engaged with something so irrational as alchemy? I'm going to share with you what I learned about this topic. And of course, as always, I share with you where I got the information from and who the authors are. And as you know, when you follow this channel, I do my best to always find the most credible and reliable sources. I first read about Newton's alchemical work in this book called The History of Magic, written by Chris Gosden, who is a professor of European archaeology at the University of Oxford. And yes, I made a full episode about this book on my channel. You can find the link in the comment section. Now, in this book, he writes briefly about John Maynard Keynes, who describes Newton, and I quote, as the last of the magicians rather than the first of the scientists. Now, who is this Mr. Keynes and why would he be credible when he speaks about Newton in this very unusual way? Well, first, Mr. Keynes was not a random person with an unfounded opinion, but a man who was one of the most influential economists of the 20th century. And second, John Keynes purchased a large part of the archive of Newton while the documents were dispersed through public auction in 1936. He did this purchase because he wanted to prevent the archive from being fragmented across the globe through many private owners. If that would have happened, then the archive would have been lost to humanity. Now, lucky for us and for humanity as a whole, he was able to secure more than one third of the documents. Next, he gave the archive to the Cambridge University where it remains to this day and where it is accessible for research. Then, in 1946, Keynes' lecture about his findings on Newton were presented during an important occasion at the Royal Society of London to honour and celebrate Newton's life and achievements. The lecture he wrote for this occasion is called Newton the Man. It is a beautiful text. I have it here and if you would be interested I will leave a link to this entire text in the comment section. But for now, here are a few striking passages from it. Here we go. I believe that Newton was different from the conventional picture of him. But I do not believe he was less great, he was less ordinary, more extraordinary than the 19th century cared to make him out. And then, a bit further, he continues. In the 18th century and since, Newton came to be thought of as the first and greatest of the modern age of scientists. A rationalist, one who taught us to think on the lines of cold and untinkered reason. I do not see him in this light. And finally he writes. 
Newton was not the first of the Age of Reason. He was the last of the magicians, the last of the Babylonians and Sumerians, the last great mind which looked out on the visible and intellectual world with the same eyes as those who began to build our intellectual inheritance rather less than 10,000 years ago. Keynes dared to describe Newton in this most unconventional way due to his thorough examination of the archive he had preserved. And he made some remarkable observations about the subjects that were to be found there. There were more than one million words in Newton's handwriting on different topics that were too sensitive to be published. The first sensitive topic was about his disbelief in the Christian doctrine of the Holy Trinity, which was in his time, to say the least, a highly controversial and dangerous position to take. There are many examples of persecutions and even death sentences of people who did not believe that the Holy Trinity, meaning God, the Word and the Holy Spirit was one and the same. The second large section of the archive contains studies about apocalyptic writings. Newton spent a lot of his time in deciphering biblical prophecies. There is even a note in the hand of Newton where he predicts the end of the world to be in the year 2060. That is very soon, but we will not linger on this topic here. because. The most unimaginable topic that is also to be found in his archive is his extensive work on alchemy, meaning, among others, the transmutation of metals from lead to gold, for example, and his pursuit to find the Philosopher's Stone and his search for the elixir of life. In this context, Keynes remarks in his 1946 lecture the following. The scope and the character of these papers have been hushed up, or at least minimized, by nearly all those who have inspected them. So the question that arises is, why were there a group of people in the last 300 years who did everything they could to prevent the disclosure of this archive? When reading all this, I was even more curious to learn about Newton and his alchemical work, which brought me to this book that I first consulted in the Royal Library of Brussels. It is a compelling story of Newton's library published in 1978, and it was written by John Harrison, who was at the time the senior under-librarian of the University Library of Cambridge. Now, this book is mostly a catalogue of the books that Newton had in his library. And it has also a few very interesting chapters about how the catalogue came about, how the library was sold several times in history at Sotheby's and at other places. The author, John Harrison, is like a detective, analyzing every bit of information that is available to reconstruct the content of the library. And one indication that we find in this book that confirms the fact that Newton was at least very interested in alchemy is that we find in his library more books on alchemy than on mathematics. To put these findings into the right context, I recommend reading this book, which is definitely another piece of the puzzle that shapes the image of Sir Isaac Newton. The ultimate book, however, on Newton's alchemical work is probably this one. It is written by William R. Newman and the title speaks for itself, Newton the Alchemist. It was published in 2019 by the Princeton University Press. Now, William R. Newman is the chair of the Department of History and Philosophy of Science and Medicine at the Indiana University Bloomington and he is also a team member of the project called The Chemistry of Isaac Newton, which is a digital edition 
of Newton's extensive alchemical laboratory records on the Indiana University's website. It is a great resource that gives everybody access to the personal alchemical notes of Isaac Newton. I leave the link to this website and also to the Newton Project website at Oxford University in the comments section. Because the Oxford website offers a similar service, but then for the religious writings of Newton. Now, if you like this content or any other content on my channel, then feel free to subscribe, like and share it with others. In that way, you can support my channel. Thank you very much. Back to the episode. Now, returning to Newman's book. It spans about 500 pages and here are four key insights that I gained from this extraordinary book that took the author 15 years of study and research to complete. The first insight that I found intriguing was that Newton believed to be on his way to become an adept of alchemy. An adept is a member of mysterious practitioners of alchemy who had mastered the secret of Chrysopia. Now, Chrysopia refers to the pursuit of transmuting base metals into gold and was a part of the quest for the Philosopher's Stone. A true adept would have, in other words, immense powers that could even change the course of history. And therefore, it was important to conduct his alchemical work in secrecy. Because of what would happen if this powerful knowledge would come into the hands of the wrong people. A second thing I learned from Newman's book is related to this secrecy. One way to safeguard their secrets, the alchemists employed a way of writing that was based upon metaphors, allusions and sometimes deliberate ambiguous language. This is one reason why the alchemical manuscripts are so difficult to understand. Here are some examples of the complexity of these writings that you can find in the book by William Newman. Imagine you read this in the notes of Newton. The virgin earth is a material that is not found upon the earth of the living. It is a corporeal spirit or a spiritual earth. Or this one. For antimony among the old was called Aries, since the ram is the first sign of the zodiac in which the sun starts to be exalted. And gold is exalted above all else in antimony. And then there is talk of a green dragon and about something called the doves of Diana and so on. This language is so far away from Newton's mathematical writings in his famous work commonly referred to as the Principia, in which he explains, among other things, the laws of motion and the law of gravity. Now, you can also see this symbolic and ambiguous way of communication in alchemical drawings. They are full of allegories and symbolic language. In order to understand these images and writings, you have to be able to decipher them first. And that is not easy at all. To make it extra difficult, there are the so-called decknamen. Decknamen meaning cover names or code names in German. They were used by alchemists as a means of veiling their work from the uninitiated. And more importantly, to hide or obscure their work from those who might have bad intentions. The complexity of the use of language and images makes this book by William Newman even more impressive. It appears as if he meticulously scrutinized every word in Newton's notes to try and reveal its intended meaning. A third insight I acquired from this book and that I find thought-provoking is that Newton was not one of the greatest physicists and mathematicians in history despite his work on alchemy, but also because of his work on alchemy. 
William Newman illustrates in his book how Newton, for example, repurposed classical alchemical techniques in his famous work on optics. It is to say the least fascinating to learn how alchemical principles seem to bleed through into scientific work. William Newman refers specifically to Newton's experiment with white light and the color spectrum you get when it passes through a prism. With the result of this experiment, Newton challenged and changed the beliefs held for two millennia about the composition of white light. And there are many other fascinating revelations in this book about the different aspects of the work of Isaac Newton. A fourth and last insight to mention here that astonished me were the many alchemists that existed before and during the times of Newton and whose writings have influenced him. With some of them he even had direct contact. There was Michael Sendivogius from Poland, David von der Becke from Germany, Robert Boyle, who was also one of the founders of the Royal Society of London. There was George Starkey, who lived in the New World, in the Americas, and published under the name Ireneus Philalites. There was Johann Gracius, or Grashof. Here are some beautiful illustrations of one of his manuscripts that can be found in the Library of Yale. And there was the German-Dutch alchemist Johann Rudolf Glaube, and the Belgian or Flemish physician Jan Baptist Helmond. Jan Helmond actually has a monument in Brussels. I have passed by it many times without being aware who this man was or what his many important contributions to science were. And just like in Newton's case, the inscription on the monument, as you can see here, has positive things to say about his significance to science. But there is no mention that he was also an alchemist. Linking alchemy with great scientists is a sensitive subject, even today, and it appears to have been overlooked and sometimes even deliberately erased from the life stories of some of our famous and influential ancestors. And because of it, it took us centuries in the case of Newton before we could start to have a better image of who Isaac Newton actually was. I very much recommend this book if you want to immerse yourself in the field of Newton's alchemy. After reading this selection of books and article about Isaac Newton, I realized again how little we sometimes know about an historical and famous person. And I find it quite interesting that even today some people struggle to come to terms with the fact that Newton was so much more than what he was most famous for. I hope you enjoyed this episode and that it was useful for you. Let me know what you think about this topic or about this episode in the comment section. And also check out the comment section for more information and references. And I very much hope to see you in the next episode of Bold Books and Bones. Meanwhile, stay curious and stay free. <laughs>